Uh, okay, so good evening and welcome everyone to our fifth international meeting with experts. This meeting is a part of the project called Rational Lighting Policy in Practice, financed by Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein from the EEA grants under the Active Citizens Fund Regional Program. This time, we are very excited to welcome two lecturers from Norway. Uh, we will have two presentations. One will be given by Sver Holm from the Department of Physics in the University of Oslo. And his topic will be light pollution regulations on the Canary Islands. Um, the second presentation will be given by Stian Dach Somerset from University of Tromsø. Uh, his topic will be regulating light pollution in Norway's marine areas. So we have two very interesting lectures coming very, very soon. Uh, but before we start, I need to traditionally introduce you to the rules of our meeting. Uh, this meeting is organized by Polaris OPP Association in cooperation with Vivar Birke, Norwegian Dark Sky Association. During this meeting, participants aren't allowed to turn on their video cameras and microphones. However, you are free to use the Zoom chat for the purpose of asking questions or commenting. If you wish to listen to the Polish interpretation, please join the appropriate Discord audio channel. There is also a Polish sign language interpreter available on the Zoom. Okay, all right. I believe not that now we can start. Uh, Sfer and Stian, the floor is yours. Uh, it would be great if you could uh, quickly introduce yourselves before the start of the lectures, okay? So should I start by sharing my screen? Yes, of course. Yes, we can see it. And um, can you still see the the uh, the slide now? Yes, yes, we can see it. <laughs> Very good. So, yes, I'm uh, Professor Sveide Holm from the Department of Physics. I I have um, an interest in uh, in um, light and uh, dark skies and and so on, more from a sort of general physics uh, point of view. My my real work is really in acoustics and and acoustic imaging for for medical purposes. But um, the the topic of this uh, uh, presentation came to me because I have um, had vacations on Canary Islands and noted that. Uh, they really are able to take care of their dark skies in a, in, a, in a unique way. And so I started studying these laws and regulations there. And as you see that uh, I've also added this little subtitle here because uh, as we go into this, I, I, I wanna talk about the effect of light pollution, not only on, on the science of astronomy, but on, on us as humans uh, in general. So I have subtitled it, Humans and the Starry Heaven. So, um, uh, Canary Islands uh, is home to, or there are two islands there. It's uh, Tenerife and La Palma, which have observatories, Ob Observatorio del Teide at uh, 2,400 meters, and uh, La Palma with, with another observatory at uh, approximately the same height, and uh, which have had telescopes since 1964. And we even have a Nordic optical telescope at La Palma since 1988. And they are sort of in the shadow of El Tade, the uh, volcanic peak there at 3,700 meters. And um, there are exceptional conditions there for observations. And that's the background of the law, because they are saying in the introduction to the law that the atmosphere over the peaks of the islands of Tenerife and La Palma has exceptional conditions for making astronomical observations. And then they go on to say that these privileged conditions may be aggravated as a result of the increase in parasitic light, what they call parasitic light due to outdoor lightning, lighting. And that's uh, what I'm gonna continue with. They, they also are concerned with operation of radio stations. So that means that they are doing radio astronomy and they are concerned with atmospheric pollution from industry and even from aircraft and exhaust fumes from aircraft. So um, when it comes to light and regulations, there's really just three topics. So that's where can you shine your light? When can you have it on? And what kind of light can you uh, 
can you admit? And that's what I'm going to come back to. Uh, but before I, I do that, I'd like to just show you some uh, effects of uh, the light pollution that we are almost all of us uh, subject to these days. This is, um, the I believe it's the Milky Way before and after, uh, and before and after air, air is related to the 2003 uh, loss of electricity in the Northeast uh, US and Canada. This is an image in the Toronto region in Canada, and uh, which affected 55 million people. And um, what you can see is that uh, to the right, the Milky Way is really visible and you can start uh, dreaming and uh, imagining uh, what it's like. And uh, to the left, which is our normal conditions, nothing can be seen. And I want to point us to what, what does it do to us as humans to not to be able to see the right hand image here. And I want to go back in time. I want to go to um, Immanuel Kant, who lived in the 1700s. He said uh, he had this, um, th this is actually his tombstone in, in what is now Kaliningrad, who was Königsberg at his time. And he said, on the tombstone, this is written, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the more often and steadily I reflect upon them the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. And you have to think about uh, Kant uh, lived, um, he, 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 he said this uh, way before we knew anything about the Big Bang and the age of the universe and stuff like that, but he was still reflecting on the starry heavens above me and was awed by it. So I'm a, uh, I want to ask this question. I'm showing here an image of the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe. And has this increased knowledge of the universe and the time and the space aspects of it, has it really given us more insight and wisdom than, for instance, Immanuel Kant had way before this was known? And let me continue with another similar image. This is the constellation Orion, which we can see in the, in the winter skies in the Northern Hemisphere, especially from January to April. And uh, to the left is uh, from a dark place and to the right is uh, uh, um, in the skies uh, above uh, a city in Utah with a half a million people. What we're seeing is, is Rigel, the, the blue star uh, to the right in this uh, Orion image, uh, the right foot, which is the sixth brightest um, star in the heavens, and, and uh, Betelgeuse, uh, the tenth brightest star, there is a reddish star here, um, which you can see if, uh, if conditions are for that. And, and then I want to go back to another reflection from um, another philosopher, but uh, now I'm going to a book which was very prominent in the medieval time on the constellation of philosophy. And on the right is pictured a 1385 Italian manuscript of this uh, book showing uh, Boethi Boethius uh, living around 500 uh, AD as a teacher on the top and in prison because this, what I'm going to quote her, was written as he was awaiting a death sentence in, in prison. And he's talking about philosophy as a, as a woman who is uh, speaking to him, uh, saying to Boethius, uh, and he's reflecting on his life and, about, um, and on fame. Just think how puny and insubstantial such fame really is. It is well known and you've seen it demonstrated by astronomers that beside the extent of the heavens, the circum circumference of the earth has the size of a point. That is to say, compared with the magnitude of the celestial sphere, it may be thought of as having no extent at all. And uh, around 500 um, after Christ, um, nobody knew about the heliocentric universe of Copernicus. People were thinking that the earth was the center of, of the universe, but still he was, uh, people were saying the size of the earth is as if it is nothing at all. 
Uh, so, uh, so that's um, no knowledge of Copernicus, no knowledge of the Big Bang. Uh, this is the Milky Way, and uh, is also by a Norwegian photographer from a dark place. I think it's uh, there's a lighthouse there. And in Norway, we say that uh, less than one third of Norwegians live in a place where the Milky Way is visible. Although, uh, as you can see, large parts of Norway are dark and people don't really live there. So, so that's why. And uh, one third is, uh, is a big uh, number because it's smaller from many other countries. And then uh, I want to take us to the, um, the last of my sort of philosophical uh, statements here. This is what's called the Psalm of the Astronomer. And now we're talking about something which is probably dating to the 600s before Christ. And uh, when, I look, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And at that time, we don't really know. We don't really know exactly when it was, this was written, but it's not unlikely that the writer of this, um, these uh, six lines even thought that the earth was flat. Still, that didn't prevent him from reflecting on the vastness of the universe and the vastness of the moon and the stars uh, compared to humans. So this is just as a background because it shows us that, um, now I'm, I'm going to back to, to, um, to the Canary Islands, but it shows us that dark skies is not only for, um, for uh, astronomers and specialized uh, people who are dealing with, uh, with astronomy, but it is for all of us in order to have a proper assessment of our, of our place in space uh, or our place in the universe. But now let me go um, to, um, to uh, the Canary Islands. And the, the law that I'm going to go a little bit into is called the Ley del Cielo, which is the law of the heaven or the law of the sky. And it, I, it took me some while to find this law. I knew that it existed, but I could only find it in Spanish. And so those references are lifted, list, listed there from the uh, official bulletin of the uh, Spanish state or government. And I had a Spanish postdoc at the time, so he helped me finding it and also on Google Translate, and he helped me uh, translate this. So um, uh, it has regulations for several aspects. It has regulations for outdoor lighting. And uh, remember my questions now, when, where, and what kind of light. So this is about where. It says that all outdoor lighting must avoid the emission of light above the horizon um, in order to minimize disturbance of astronomical observations. So they should only be directed downwards, not upwards. And then the article seven here is about what kind of light. And that's, uh, that's particular for this uh, law. Uh, the spectral distribution of the light emitted from the lamps must be, must be such that the total spectral radiation for all wavelengths less than 440 nanometers is less than 15% of the total radiation. And if not, you need a filter to, to fix that. This is a very physicist way of uh, specifying um, the kind of light. And I'm going to go, go back to that, what that really means. They have uh, you know, also... Um, similar laws for street lighting and here, also, here they cover all questions where, what kind and, and when. So these fixtures for street lighting must be designed in such a way that all emitted light is project, projected below the horizon, horizontal plane, so da, directed downwards again. And article nine, in road lighting, the only permitted lamps are low pressure sodium vapor lamps. This was the regulations from 1992, and that was the only alternative. And this has been expanded on, and I'll come back to that in 2017. And then they come about, uh, Article 11 is about when, uh, because we need, uh, they need the devices to control the luminous flux and to reduce it to one third of the normal after midnight, okay. unless it's so, uh, dim that it uh, is, uh, is necessary for road safety. 
Uh, as I said, uh, um, there was an amendment to these uh, regulations in 2017, and, um, and they said that the use of other lamps with different technology will also be permitted, but they shall correspond to or reduce the impact on astronomical quality relative to the lamps specified in, in the previous uh, to, um, from the regulations from the 90s with these natrium uh, lamps. So what does it mean with these 440 nanometers? It, if we, it's a more direct measure than color temperature and it's a more exact measure as, as well. These are the, uh, is, is the spectral distribution or a spectral, um, or a, an image of the spectrum of light from, um, from ultraviolet to the left to infrared uh, to the right. And uh, what we're talking about here that less than 15% below 440 nanometers to the left of this arrow. And this is in order to avoid the effect of Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere, because uh, those um, small wavelength, wavelength um, light energy scatters uh, better in, in, with, light, with the air molecules than, um, than the large uh, wavelength red lights, red light for instance. And then these, um, these low pressure sodium lights, uh, which uh, is the old standard for street lighting, that, that's here in the, in the yellow orange, uh, 589 nanometer range. So that's well to the right of this uh, 440 nanometers, of course. How does this compare to the standard color temperature specification? Well, it, uh, this is the color temp temperature of a black body here we have, uh, Again, the, the visible light, uh, I show that as, as a sort of rainbow to the low, low, um, below the figure there. And um, sunshine is uh, 5,800 Kelvin. What I'm showing here is a greenish, 5,005, yellow, 5,000, and then the red dish from 5,005 and, and so on. This is the um, Planck uh, spectrum, spectral curve. Um, so it has a formula and it also has a maximum, a peak, which is given by Rien, uh, this lambda, um, for this formula for the lambda for the wavelength of the peak. Um, and uh, again, here is the 440, this arrow I'm talking about on and off now, this arrow for 440 nanometers. So less than 15% of the energy should be to the left of that arrow. Now this is a complication with, um, with the LED lights, uh, because LED lights are not black black bodies. They have this double peaked distribution. Um, so it has a sharp blue peak from the LED chip, the, the left-hand peak here. And it has a broad, uh, a secondary broad yellow peak, which is sort of uh, re-radiated from the phosphorus layer. So sharp blue shines on the phosphorus layer and then it re, uh, is re-emitted as more yellowish kind of light. Um, and so this means that LEDs will always uh, emit um, this uh, bluish light. Uh, and and I'm, again, I'm showing these two arrows below the curve here, this uh, 440 nanometer arrow and as well as the yellow for the sodium uh, lamps. Uh, and uh, so typical spectral distribution for white LEDs where, where you can control the, uh, um, the color temperature is like this. Um, uh, again, showing these references at 440 and, and uh, for, for the sodium lamps. And, um, this, uh, and here is shown the sort of equivalent, equivalent color temperature, which looks the same for the eye. So I'm showing here the 2,700 Kelvin, and you will see that, uh, let me try to see if I can turn on the cursor here. You see that it has this peak uh, here, but then it has this little peak from the blue as well, which is not so prominent, but it is still there. So this, uh, this um, 2,700 LED would the problem is okay with, with respect to this uh, limit of 440. These, the second curve I want to show, and that was the, the, the brown one. The, uh, the green one 
is also probably okay. So that's 3000 Kelvin, but then when you come to 3005 and 4000 and so on, this, this blue peak becomes so dominant or so prominent that uh, probably it is not, does not satisfy this less than 15% below 440 nanometers. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the, um, that is, this is physics based um, criterion for, um, for um, uh, allowable emission. Uh, the laws in, uh, in the Canary Islands goes on with this um, more regulations for when you can have light, so especially with this after midnight um, regulations. So decorative lighting of public buildings, monuments and gardens, and you can use all kinds of lamps, but they have to be turned off at 12 at night and also always directed from top to bottom. So that's the where question. And on sports and recreational facilities, it must also be off after midnight unless you have a sort of a, a, some sort of game, a sports game or whatever, which has a, a special authorization to, to have light on after midnight. So this uh, brings me to the, uh, the end of my presentation. So what I've shown is that um, they, uh, they have these regulations for where, so they have light fixtures where you have no light above the horizontal plane. They have this what kind of light, spectral distribution, less than 15% below 440, and preferably this yellowish kind of light. And when for roads, you should turn down the light to one third uh, after midnight, and other kinds of decorative lighting should be turned completely off. This is very much similar to what those uh, recommendations that we have in our Dark Sky Association in Norway. We have this uh, horizontal uh, recommendation but we don't have this uh, very physics-based uh, wavelength-based criterion. We have 2,700 K Kelvin or war warmer, that is a lower number than 2,700 Kelvin um, color temperature, which is a sort of an amber uh, LED. And we recommend that light is dimmed or turned off at night on facades and holiday homes in the mountains should, uh, should be turned off completely. So, so this is the only difference then. So uh, that uh, completes my um, presentation about, uh, about the effect of light on both um, astronomy and uh, on humans and, and how uh, that um, can be, ha has been controlled or regulated in, on the Canary Islands for the last few decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sver. That was an amazing lecture, very interesting. Uh, and I think we will do the question session uh, later after the second uh, presentation by Stian. So, uh, Stian, let's go on. Yeah, I'll try to share my screen. Um, okay. Da, 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 PowerPoint. Just need to grant the um, system preference to see. Okay, I think we're going to see it. That was the summary. <laughs> Okay, can you see the presentation yes, and yes, can yes. you still hear me? Yes, yes you, can, you can go on. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Stian Dal Somershat. I just want to thank you so much for having me. I, um, I graduated law school last year uh, in the town that I grew up in. And you can see a picture there in the background. That's Tromsø, North in Norway. And in my last year at school, I wrote my master thesis on the regulations of light pollution in Norway's marine areas. And that is going to be the basis of my presentation here today. And um, if you have any questions later on, uh, you can always email me at the address you can see there. I can also leave that afterwards. But let's um, move on. Um, first off, um, I just wanted to briefly introduce you to my introduction to light pollution. So you kind of know where I come from, 
with this whole thing. I grew up in Tromsø, as I said, uh, and you can see it pictured under the Northern Lights to your left there. Um, and it kind of it kind of explains the whole thing itself. The picture. I mean, Tromsø is far above the Arctic Circle with pitch black darkness in the winter and the midnight sun in the summer. Uh, light and dark is an integral part of our way of living. And the Northern Lights, for example, are a crucial element in our tourist industry. Light pollution from our city, however, is making the Northern Lights more and more difficult to see every winter with the increasing, with the increase in population. Um, and people will have to travel further and further away to see the Northern Lights, even those who, who live here. And I didn't really know about this problem until I stumbled across the book to your right, uh, The End of Night by Paul Boggard back in 2015, I think it was. And it, that was kind of what set me on this path to combat light pollution. And I highly recommend the book. And I think he, Paul is a, a very nice person. You can always send him an email as well if you haven't heard of him. So uh, my master thesis was on, uh, as I said, how do you regulate light pollution in, in Norway's marine areas? And tonight I will present three examples of how it is regulated in Norwegian law or how it is not regulated. Because as we just saw in the, the presentation from, from Sada, the Canary Islands has very, well, I mean, you can always discuss what's good and bad regulation. In, in Norway, we have zero form of you know, detailed regulation on this when it comes to, to, to lighting levels, to lumen, um, and such. The Norwegian Public Road Administration has certain you know, guidebooks on how you kind of design street lighting and such, but you can always discuss their legal basis. Um, and I think that by presenting these three um, acts, I will try and paint a, oh, not a complete picture because we don't have time for that, but you know, I'll try to paint a picture of how the frame, legal framework in Norway works in regards to, to light pollution. And um, I think we can just move right on to the Pollution Control Act, where I will be looking at the definition of pollution. And as it says there, I'll also go to the Nature Diversity Act and the Aquaculture Act before a summary. Let's see. OK, so um, we, and when I say we, I mean like us who you know, care about the subject and have researched it, we often define light pollution as, you know, excessive, misdirected or obtrusive artificial light. Um, and in the Norwegian Pollution Control Act, there is a general prohibition against pollution of various types. And this law applies to the entirety of Norway's territory, with very few exceptions. And it does include, you know, the, the oceans around us. It does not, however, generally apply to light pollution. In Paragraph six, where pollution itself is defined, you can see that it is, it is explicitly stated that light is only pollution um, to the extent that the pollution authorities have decided that it is that. And who the authorities are depends on what level of governance your consent to pollute would be relying on. That means that the state authorities can decide that light is pollution at a national level, the county municipalities can decide that at a county level and the local municipalities decide, can decide that light is pollution at a commune slash municipality level. The problem is that none of them use this authority to decide, you know, um, at what like instances light should be regarded as pollution. It is not something they really care to, to regulate or act on. Um, and this system where it is up to the authorities to decide where and when the prohibition against light as pollution should be enacted uh, is only for light. I mean, if you look at how noise is regulated in Norwegian law as pollution, it does not require the state's you know, blessings to be pollution. It just is defined as pollution. And this system, obviously, you know, it diminishes the status of light pollution both in the legal framework and um, in like those who decide, it is diminishes in you know in their in their mind and, and in the citizens 
who, who look at the framework and go, okay, so it isn't that important. And um, well, the Pollution Control Act is more than 40 years old. It came from 1981. And in the documents that were made by the bureaucrats preparing this act, you can read that they thought that light pollution is only a challenge for neighbors of artificial light. Like if your neighbor has gigantic strobe lights or massive Christmas lights uh, or whatever. And right now, um, we can't really blame them because in the, the you know, late 70s, early 80s, the green movement had not gained the traction it has today. No one looked at, or very few people that I know, <laughs> looked at light pollution as an ecological challenge or as you know, a human health challenge. I mean, you look at Sveta and, and people have always you know, wondered about the sky. So, but uh, I mean, no one looked at the, you know, the human health issues or ecological issues. At the same time, this doesn't excuse the authorities though, because we have come so far in the research on this subject. So I think that a change in this law is in order. We know, we know so much about this now that it is a challenge that should be handled the same way that other types of pollution are, even though you know, light pollution might not be as critical in, well, in the moment as you know, um, in air pollution and an oil spill. I mean, that's a catastrophic thing to happen right there and then. But uh, an enlightenment on the subject is uh, much needed, I think, at least. Um, let's move on to the nature, oh, the nature Diversity Act. In the Nature Diversity Act, I was considering several paragraphs that we could kind of look at, but I will present the regulations on the, um, that regulate the protection of entire areas like, um, national parks, for example, in light pollution terms or in the light pollution world, this could be like the International Dark Sky Association, you know, has the, um, the dark sky parks, the dark sky reserves, the dark sky communities. No such area exists in Norway with the IDA status. And what I, you know, did in my thesis, I looked at, you know, is it possible for the Norwegian state government to protect you know, marine areas uh, protect the dark sky in these areas or protect the organisms in these areas from the effects that light pollution has. And when I started doing that, I looked at, you know, what are the terms that need to be fulfilled to protect an area in a marine area in Norwegian law? And it says in paragraph 39 in this act that threatened, rare, or vulnerable nature can be, you know, protected by, um, and, and I did like a protection act. And so I went, okay, what marine areas in Norway have threatened rare or vulnerable nature that are affected by the negative effects of light pollution? And I read about, you know, coral reefs in Norway for the first time. I only thought, you know, not only thought, but you know, when you think coral reefs, you all, you often think of, you know, the Pacific, you know, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but Norway has a lot of coral reefs. Every red dot on the map to your right is a coral reef. And um, light pollution has been shown to have several negative effects to coral reefs. Corals affected by artificial light are put under oxidative stress that could lead to damage to their fats, but also their DNA, which leads to cell death. Um, artificial light can also you know, reduce their productivity and with a compromised photosynthetic process, productivity rates are reduced, which slows or hinders growth. And in a, in an, on an earth where, you know, we're losing coral reefs day by day, that is drastic. And making the situation worse, the rising sea temperatures bleaches the reefs. And it is shown in scientific studies that bleached reefs are more vulnerable to artificial light. So compared to the tropical reefs, the Norwegian reefs have adapted to the Arctic darkness. It is critical that they are kept in this darkness. Artificial lights in the Norwegian sea and the Arctic ocean further north are shown to affect organisms at depths of up to 200 meters. And considering this, 
it is not unreasonable to argue that the regulations in the Nature Diversity Act could be used to protect Norwegian reefs explicitly um, against artificial light. And here I wanted to show you the two reefs, uh, or I can show you them, because there's somewhere like there's somewhere in the, the red cluster, like kind of in the middle there, where there are more reefs than any other place. Uh, two of them are protected with the Nature Diversity Act on that legal basis, but not from light. They're protected from bottom trawling fishing, which is you know a fishing technique that kind of scrapes the the surface of the ocean and um, and destroys the reefs more, you know, physically. Two of like the, the reefs are the Tisle Reef and the Seligrun Reef in the uh, Seligrun protected area. Um, the Tisle Reef uh, is the only known reef in the world of the uh, of the species uh, yellow Lophelia, and the Seligrun Reef uh, is the most shallow Lophelia reef in the world at just forty meter steps. Because it is so shallow, it's a lot more likely that artificial light will reach it. And this is a good argument um, for light pollution to be considered something the local protection acts in this area also protects from. What I want or and argue is that the local authorities should at least consider artificial lights to be one of the many reasons these areas should be protected when they make their local acts and when they act on them. I think that just being aware of the problem will make it more easy to solve and will kind of spread the awareness. And when you spread awareness, more people are going to think, huh, okay, this area also needs to be protected for that reason, because we have the same problem. The last bit of leg legislation I will look at is the Aqu Aquaculture Act. It has a statutory objective, which is the, the paragraph that kind of states the intent of the law that the commercial interests in aquaculture must be seen in light of sustainability. Sustainability is you know, often, under, often understood as the ability to maintain or support a process continuously over time. And when we think sustainability, you know, it's, it's reasonable to think of ecological processes that need to be kept intact. The question uh, for me is then, what does this goal of sustainability in light of the protected market and commercial interests mean for the consequences light pollution from aquaculture has in the ocean. In Norwegian law, it is a basic principle that the acts must be interpreted in light of their statutory objectives. In spite of this, it seems that light pollution is often overlooked when aquaculture permissions are given, for example. And this is in spite of, you know, you can see it in the picture to your right that um, the fishnets used in the aquaculture are often lit, artificially lit up to increase growth rates in fish, which speeds up their maturing processes, which means that you know you can sell more fish, you can process more fish, which increases profits, and that's why you know the, the commercial interests are very protected in this law. And fishing is a huge business in Norway, and we won't, we want to keep it that way. These lights, however, do not limit themselves to the nets only. Light escapes through and affects fish and other organisms in the area around. Both the type of light and the intensity of light matters, as Sverre has shown, but it is proven that fish, larvae, snails, plankton, and microorganisms all react to light, and we have the most drastic consequences when they are attracted to it or when they are repelled to it. I mean, because um, attraction, you know, you, uh, you see several organisms, both underwater and, and over water, be attracted to the light and they gather around them, and it makes them very easy prey for other animals under the sea. Um, they can be repelled away from their former safe areas. And these artificially lit up um, sub ocean uh, areas are shown to have more lice that bring uh, diseases to fish in the aquaculture nets. So, I mean, and lice is uh, sickness. And when the fish gets sick, you can't sell them. So I think there are, you know, it, it is undoubtedly this and this disturbance of ecosystems and the food chains that come with this light. And I think it is certainly a relevant uh, thing to consider when the authorities assess if or when uh, aquaculture should be approved if they intend to use this technology. So that's just my, my presentation. Um, 
I hope this has shown you that the, the legal framework for the protection of Norway's marine areas from the effects of light pollution is, is weak. Um, there are no detailed laws on a state level. The opportunities are there, but the authorities are yet to act uh, on them, really. And I think it's just uh, crucial that the unique arc darkness of this area is protected because of the, the, the light and, and dark cycle that has been here since ever, you know, since the earth was shaped this way it is. Um, and I think that's going to be my selling point in the future when it comes to pushing for change. So thank you so much for the attention. I'll try to stop my sharing. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. So huge thanks both to Svare and Stian for these uh, incredible lectures. It was very interesting to hear all this fascinating information and very important. Uh, I'm sure that we all have learned a lot about protecting the dark skies and nighttime ecology from a new uh, Norwegian point of view. So uh, that's amazing for us. Um, and now is the best time for questions from our participants to our uh, lecturers. So if anyone has any questions, please post them on Zoom chat, either in English or in Polish. Uh, and we have three questions from uh, Michael Tver, and I will read them out loud. Uh, why is this law only valid in certain regions? Yeah, I can. Um, that's just kind of how our governance kind of works. We have uh, national laws, uh, which is which you know are for the entirety of Norway's population, but they can be uh, defined to certain areas as you know the um, the um, nature diversity law could be defined as to just be on the, the land structure of Norway uh, or just certain parts of our oceanic ownership. Um, the other example is that you know the the local protection acts are. Uh, put in place by the local government in that area. So the that's just the structure of the Norwegian, you know, uh, political system. We have the, the state governance, and then we have the the region governance, and then we have the local governance. Um, but you know, only the state governance can uh, you know create laws that are enacted for the entirety of the population. Yes. So I think that it answers the question. And the second question is, how can I help protect the dark sky? How to successfully convince my politicians? Well, that's that's what <laughs> that's what we're trying to figure out. I think all of us. Yes. Um, yes. On on the Canary Islands, uh, Svada has shown that they're doing a a good well. Uh, they're doing a job to to create you know detailed laws from the like if physics perspective. Um, I think in in general, I think to, to help protect the dark sky, I think it just starts with spreading awareness and doing, you know, physically what you can do yourself by by protecting your own artificial light sources, uh, talking about the subject, you know, just being here helps. Uh, there are a lot of letters written, a lot of articles written that can help you convince your politicians uh, in your area. I don't know if anyone else has uh, answered that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Svara, would you like to uh, add something to this? No, I, I don't. I don't think I have anything. I, I, I agree with Stian. This is this is why we are having these meetings <laughs> to try to understand how we can influence. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, and the third question: How can I check if my lighting is good? So that's a, a general type of question. Uh, would you like to answer Stian or Svara? Um, well, you can do like a, a sight test. You, you know, if you try to, to look at the night sky with a, a telescope or whatever, you know, um, you can measure the, the night sky in the, the Bortle scale, um, which has certain, you know, um, things you can look for in the sky, certain stars that kind of, if you can see that star, you know, you're at that level at the Bortle scale. Um, I don't know much about, you know, technology or measurements myself, uh, really. 
Yeah, so those basic principles uh, of that the lighting uh, lighting should be uh, of warm color. Uh, it should be emitting light only upwards. Uh, so these are just some basic rules uh, rules which can be uh, found, for example, on the International Dark Sky Association website. Uh, there are uh, some good infographics which uh, show how to pro protect the dark sky uh, the best. Okay. And, and, and I think we can uh, take inspiration from these Canary Islands laws which has this, uh, when should light be to be turned off as much as possible after midnight, it should be directed downwards. And that's easy to do if you are aware of it. I, I actually, after I first um, studied these laws, I changed all my external lights uh, on my house to only go downwards and also to have uh, these uh, controls. And also to, I, I bought, um, controllable where the uh, light temperature could be controlled and, and made them as yellow as possible. So, so it's you, today you can find products that will do this at least for from a sort of a personal point of view uh, on your own house. Okay, thank you very much. And there is also a question from Christina. Uh, what do you know about light pollution at the period of the white nights? So that, that is um, in the, with midnight sun, I think. Or uh, you know, I believe that it's related to summer in Norway. Uh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. Well, um, I I mainly look at this from you know uh, an ecological st standpoint, and and the organisms, the animals, the the living things underwater in Norway have all adapted to to this to the midnight sun you from you know a process of thousands of millions of, of years uh we don't really know much about it i mean the, the effects of artificial light during those nights is not the same as it is you know when it's pitch black darkness because that's just how light works it, it shines bright it's brightest well it shines as bright as it does during the night but it's not as you know prevalent of a feature in a in a bright sky it's the same as you know a summer day um so I don't think we know much about it because I think it would be hard to measure because the, you can't really separate the, the, um, the artificial light from the, the light of the sun, which literally is as bright as day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so do we have any more uh, questions? There are a couple of questions to me, I think, from Andre Mohar. Yeah. And there is a comment on the Canary Islands that this is very weak regulation because there is no limits on wattage or total lumens. Yeah, I guess uh, he's right. But um, then on the other hand, these laws have been there since the 90s and they seem to work. So I guess in practice, um, the limits are, or the laws are good enough because otherwise they would have changed and they amended them for LED, LED light. And so they would have amended them for for this, uh, I guess as well, but of course I'm not um, I'm not the lawgiver on the Canary Islands, so I cannot really tell. And then there is a similar question from him also uh, that this limit of 440 nanometers is just half of the blue peak of 4,000 k LED. This is why it is perhaps possible to use 3,500 k LED, which is very bad. Yeah, I agree. And the in the nor in in this um, dark sky. Norwegian Dark Sky Association, we recommend actually 2,700 Kelvin or, or less. So, so 3, I agree 3,500 and even more is, is not to be recommended. So I guess that's what I can comment on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and now I think we will be uh, finishing our meeting soon. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I would like to ask uh, every participant to rate whether whether you enjoy today's today's meeting or not. Uh, so please post your rating in the chat, uh, any number between one and ten, uh, where ten is the highest rating, which means that you liked our meeting, and one is the lowest rating. So please uh, write your opinion in the chat. And uh, while you do that, 
I also wanted to show you the poster for the upcoming 10th annual Dark Sky Festival in Sopot Niewielka. Uh, the poster is now is in Polish as it's very new, but there will be also an English version. So uh, let me show it how it looks like. Okay. So this is the poster. Can you see it? Can I get a confirmation? Okay, uh, so the event will take place on uh, 30 and 31st of July. Uh, so at the end of the next month, uh, its main topics are astronomy, uh, stargazing and light pollution. Uh, it's an annual event uh, and it's its 10th edition. So uh, we invite everyone to join us. Uh, it will be available for both Polish and English speaking participants. Uh, there will also be many lectures conducted uh, by experts experts from various uh, fields, night, night sky observations, and many, many other things. Uh, we also will have some guests from Norway and Slovenia, and Stian is uh, one of those guests. Uh, we will meet him uh, in Sopotnia Wielka. Uh, and Maybe we also have some uh, lectures made by uh, our Norwegian friends and from a Slovenian expert, Andrei Mohar. Okay, so this is the poster, which I wanted to show to you. Thank you very much for your writings. Um, so that was just a quick information uh, before the end of the meeting. So once again, uh, biggest thanks to our amazing lecturers, Stian and uh, Svara. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to your presentations. Thank you everyone for participating in today's meeting. See you at the Dark Sky Festival or in our next online meeting. Stay tuned for further information, which will be posted on our websites and on Facebook and Instagram pages of Polaris UPP Association and our partners Bivar Mirke and Dark Sky Slovenia. Uh, everyone once again, and as always, have a good night. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you very much.